thank you once again. And now we move on towards the fourth technical session of the day. This is about the state of state finances. Now, while India is expected to experience Amrit Kal over the next 25 years, the fiscal health of our Indian states remains fragile. RBI has itself named five states as highly stressed, while another five remain above the comfort mark. States' tendency towards handing out cash subsidies and freebies like provision of free utility services and revival of the old pension scheme have put states in this peculiar position. The pandemic only aggravated these fiscal positions. How do states handle such a critical challenge to their fiscal situation amidst rising aspirations of their population? Can Finance Commission alone come to their rescue? What are new sources of tax and non-tax revenues even while GST has subsumed major taxes in not so distant past. This is going to be thrust of our next technical session. And to anchor this one, we would like to request Mr. Ranan Banerjee, Government Sector Leader, PwC India, to please join us on stage. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Banerjee. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to all our esteemed panelists for the session. Starting with Mr. V.K. Garg, former financial advisor to Chief Minister of Punjab. Pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Garg, once again. Please put your hands together for Mr. Raja Gopal Devara, additional Chief Secretary, Revenue Maharashtra. A very warm welcome to you, sir. We're also being joined by Ms. Namrata Vishni, Joint Secretary, Finance, Tax, Government of Rajasthan. A very warm welcome to Professor Ashwani Kumar, Dean, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And the final panelist on this panel is Ms. Kavita Rao, Public Finance Expert, NIPFP. A very warm welcome to you, Ms. Kavita Rao. Can we do a quick mic check with you? Mic check. It's working? Yeah, yeah. Ms. Rao? Ma'am, just say something. Hello. Ma'am, um, a little closer to you and a little louder. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. So now the stage is finally set. Mr. Banerjee, it's all yours. Thank you. And thank you so much, TIOL, for inviting me and uh, to and, and this esteemed panel to discuss state of state finances. Now, uh, if we jog our memory a bit and uh, go back in time, so there was a time in early 2000, 2001, 2, 3, when uh, the state of state finances were really, really poor. And we had situations where many state treasuries used to be closed down for many days during the month so that the state doesn't go into a default when uh, demand for payment is made to them. Of course, post that, we had uh, the VAT uh, that came in, and that gave a huge tax boost uh, to the state governments. And we saw a significant improvement in the state finances. This was followed, of course, by the GST implementation, which also gave a good boost to uh, uh, the revenues. And of course, the economic growth, per se, led to a growth in the central pool of uh, resources that, that got devolved to the states. So the states were actually in very good uh, fiscal health, uh, barring a couple uh, which, which had stress because of high public debt. However, we have seen that uh, slowly and steadily the, the situation is not as good 
had as uh, it was a few years back. And uh, the debt levels clearly have gone up significantly at the state level. So uh, there is a change in, 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 the, in the kind of uh, situation in the state of state finances. So uh, Mr. we had Mr. Vicky Garg and he was an advisor to uh, one of the state governments. So I'll turn to him. So Mr. Garg, what do you think have been the contributors to this change in the, in the state of state finances? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Shalender, for inviting me to this eminent panel. I must uh, say, you know, I, I, my last position in the government of India was with Mr. Chidambaram as the finance minister. And at that time, one very eminent person told me that it is very tough to be the finance minister when your prime minister is an economist. Today, I am surrounded on my left and right by people who are eminent experts in economics, public finance, or they are active in bureaucracy. So I will be making my remarks more on what I happen to see about the state of finances in the state that I worked for five years, from 2017 to 2022. Another thing is, by some kind of training over the last two decades, I refrain from making judgments that something is good or something is bad. All that one can say is that these are the facts. Some people will say these are not so bad, these are better than before, these are better than X, Y, Z state and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to say that the state of state finances is good or bad. With this short backdrop, let me say a few things. There was a time, you know, when we talk about the state of state finances, and to put it in very simple terms, we talk about two major parameters. What is the fiscal deficit of the state? And another interlinked factor could be what is its debt to GDP ratio. There are other parameters, Kavita and there are others who can talk about that. So there was a time when this fiscal deficit for states used to be 4%. But India saw a kind of buoyancy from 2003 or 4 onwards. The fiscal deficit had come down for the states to 2.5%. One shouldn't read too much if the fiscal deficit went up during the COVID times. But if you see recent times, I think it will be now something like 3.5%. Some people may be uncomfortable with this number, but I think it's not that bad a number. The problem is that this is not a uniform number for everybody. The variations are too much. We have 28 states and a few union territories with legislature. The disparities are so huge across states. And RBI has itself mentioned that five states are in precarious situation. And I happen to work in one which was perhaps topping the list. So what do these states do? And that particular state had a deficit as recent as last year of 5% or so, a debt to GDP ratio which on paper is 45%, one of the highest in the country. It could be other off balance sheet uh, liabilities as well, plus the guarantees and so on and so forth. And there are quite a few other states also in the same category. So the question is, why have the states reached this kind of a state? Now, it's very commonsensical that the fiscal situation of a state is revenue on one side and the expenditure on the other side. And everybody would like to spend more. Everybody would like to tax less and everybody would like to borrow less. But that's not kind of possible. Something has to be done. The impression that I got during my five years in the state was most people wanted to have the cake and eat it too. Now, let's see what have we done to the revenue side. 
Now, there are many ways to measure the revenues, what is the growth over the last year and so on and so forth, but one better measure in my view is what is the ratio of tax to the GDP of a state. That ratio, I think, has remained more or less constant over the years. Whatever we talk about GST, et cetera, et cetera, for states as a whole, that ratio hasn't gone up in any significant way. If you talk about non-tax revenues, they have also not shown any significant growth over the years. The ratio to the GDP is more or less constant. What has gone up is the expenditure. Now, if you take some states like state of Punjab, because it's all in the public domain, the average, the, the salary portion of Punjab, I think was 40 percent higher than the national average. The pension was likewise 40 percent higher than the national average. Debt servicing was a far, far higher number. So as a result, when we talk about the position of the states, we talk about what is your committed expenditure, salary, pensions, interest. Now this for the country as a whole average is around 50, 54 percent. For a state like Punjab, it was in excess of 70 percent. Punjab is not alone. There are a few other states also which are in excess of 70 percent goes into what is called as committed expenditure. You know, salary, pensions, interest cannot be negotiated. Punjab on top of that had a power subsidy close to 17 percent. So if 93 percent of your budget, revenue budget, is spent on these four heads, you have to pay another 4 or 5 percent to the local bodies. You need something like 17 percent to run your office, your stationery, your petrol and diesels and so on and so forth. So how do states run like that? So, and then on top of it, you are hearing now state after state talking of revert, reverting to old pension schemes. Many states are talking about the freebies. And I'm not fundamentally against any of these. The only point is we know what direction some of the states at least are going to. We've seen what has happened to some of the countries in our neighborhood. So that does raise some concern maybe or even alarm for some of the states, what we need to do going forward. So this, I think, is, in my understanding, the sum total of the position in the states. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gag, and uh, thank you for putting some of the facts, and uh, we, we can judge, as you said, that whether they're good or bad. Now, Professor Ashni Kumar, you are coming uh, from academia, but you in the past have also been closely working with the government. Uh, you, uh, uh, now, now, I can. now you can hear? Yeah. Okay. So, Professor Kumar, you, you are coming from academia now and you have worked very closely with the government also in the past. So, what is your take on this? Why, why the state of state finances are where they are now? I mean, this is a, quite an interesting uh, query to begin with, uh, reflect historically and institutionally too. Um, I guess, you know, uh, when I work, you know, my chief is here, Dr. Devra. I, 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 on a lighter note, I always call him Dr. Devra, chief of finances, you know. Uh, you know, he's our Radisthan chief secretary and also looks after treasury. I mean, like the Kuber, the Kuber is sitting here from Maharashtra. And, you know, what I'm going to uh, talk, uh, respond very briefly, because this is a complex area. And uh, since we work on public finance, uh, and uh, I come from the experience of assessing state finances from my perspective in the sense of, you know, last mile perspective. I guess uh, most of the bureaucrats, officials working here and uh, sitting here in the room understand what I mean by last mile finances. If you look at the constitutional design, the way we look at, you know, fiscal federalism or the dynamics of fiscal federalism, it's not bottom up, you know, historically. Uh, it's always, you know, top down. So that's a flaw. As an economist, you would notice, and as a political economist, perhaps you would notice it, you know, that this, this crisis that we see today, perhaps in, you know, places like Punjab, is not coming because Punjab is, uh, you know, inflicting, self-inflicted the debt, you know, knowingly. You know, what I'm trying to, you know, there is something that, you know, I'm a revisionist uh, development economist, you know. I always challenge the mainstream economic thinking 
because the mainstream economic thinking is largely centralized and you know uh, it's not bottom up economic thinking so what has happened you know we need to really revise our thinking also about uh, state finances so historically speaking if you look at uh, 70s 80s 90s and i worked with you know uh, when dr manmohan singh was prime minister who also happened to be our teacher in this school and many of us have been taught by uh, professor manmohan singh we belong to his generation but by the time if you look at professor manmohan singh or your the liberalization globalization began its journey i think this whole you know institutional architecture of staying with what we call vertical imbalance you know between the center and the state finances continue and this is still continues you know this vertical imbalance and this vertical imbalance has to be corrected by the finance commission and finance commission has been doing excellent job i would not say they have not been in fact you know nk singh mr nk singh led finance commission in fact noted this paradox that there has to be rebalancing act done by finance commission in terms of bottom up approach you know what has happened if you look at state uh, you know finances and estates are under tremendous stress financial stress because the constitutional design does not allow them to access you know our you know maharashtra as I, i live in mumbai i work at tata institute of social sciences and i'm i'm going to ask him also that uh, you you have no ability you know regulatory or legal ability to access finances outside your state that's limited you know that limited because of the constitutional design of the fiscal federalism so that's one of the major what i would call as a economist a structural issue that affects officials dealing with the treasury coming back here you know i don't want to give a long lecture here but i will be very brief i am already exceeded my time so let me share with the, you know all of you uh, that despite that why reverses uh, and especially in the last 5 years and because of the catastrophic uh, you know covid uh, you know finances have suffered state finances particularly and i have already referred to the structural issue that does not allow states because if you look at you know the panchayati system pri system the devolution and the central government has not uh, accounted for that you know and therefore the state governments and the state officials top state officials have been struggling to you know deal with uh, you know issues arising out of the devolution of the finance to the third tier that is not in part of the mainstream thinking of the state finances so the good news as per the rbi report i must share i don't want to depress uh, you know and continue with the pessimistic economic analysis the more optimistic economic analysis is following that rbi clearly in its latest reports reminds us that the good news here and the state finance have, have uh, finances have started improving you know and especially in three states if you look at odisha you know my colleagues are from odisha here and maharashtra and gujarat so if you look at odisha maharashtra and gujarat they have done tremendous uh, you know improvement in terms of the state finances in fact uh, i don't want to compare apple and oranges but odisha and maharashtra are close you know despite obvious dissimilarities you know given the odisha a small state and the mining state and the maharashtra but you know maharashtra odisha and gujarat have benefited something what i call a missing variable the missing variable is governance factor you know they have improved uh, and they have taken care of state finances you know maintaining what we call you know uh, the debt uh, and uh, you know and debt and revenue balance they have maintained and they have successfully also tried to implement frmb you know you know fiscal management and budget uh, response fiscal responsibility and budget management act so that's that's something we should uh, you know keep in mind that despite these reverses and despite the obvious challenges even my gst colleagues are sitting here they know that gst is still you know evolving and the gst revenue is still lower than expected you know although the gst has also shown buoyancy in the recent times in the last one year post covid but still gst is uh, the revenue is uh, lower than expected but despite that uh, the good news i said with everyone that you know except punjab which is a bleeding case and i'm sure that my colleagues in punjab economists have been continuously arguing with the government to deal with it 
institutionally on some urgent uh, basis to you know rectify that issue so on the basis of equity equity and efficiency i think states need to be seen primarily from their own lenses rather than from the lens of the central government and some states have been doing quite good so i stop here I and mean, this is a large complex area i will come back again thank you thank you professor kumar so uh, kavita i'll turn to you so uh, there was a long prolonged discussion on and i think professor ashwini kumar touched on it about uh, what will be the revenue neutral rate for gst uh, what should what should be the slabs etc and we were having good buoyancy under the vat regime when uh, when we transition into gst so given the experiences that we have seen now have the gst revenues met what was expected and especially from the state's perspective um this is um, an interesting question because uh, we can answer it so many different ways um for the purposes of this discourse the idea that we had two years of covid uh, is very useful because uh, we can infer whatever we want to infer and have evidence to support the same we have had gst in operation for about 6 years now um we uh, to be fair uh, what i would say is that um we haven't done dramatically well but we haven't done dramatically badly either so um if you look at the uh, the ratios uh, you will find that uh, as mr garg said uh, your tax to gdp ratios are sort of stable the initial two years got a shock um, then we had covid uh, the last two years we've been seeing very very exciting growth rates and that's to be commended um, but we have the challenge of not being able to disentangle what is happening because economy is growing because uh, uh, better compliance is happening more people are part of the gst system and what is happening because of various administrative initiatives to encourage compliance or to improve administration and so on and so forth so we can't disentangle the two and um, that is a that's a challenge because uh, the premise of gst is to get better compliance the premise of gst is to get a larger base and we are not yet able to infer one or the other what is good news is that we haven't suffered and uh, what is um, work in progress is the fact that we hope to see good buoyancy for let's say for 5 years to ensure that we are at a level where we feel comfortable so that is what i would say but and going back to uh, what uh, mr garg and mr K uh, professor kumar said uh, there is substantial variation across states so even if you see gst performance there are if you a uh, tag back to how many states claimed compensation how many didn't claim compensation you'll find there's substantial variation you'll also find that if you take the tax to gdp gsdp ratio for states you'll find that there is uh, not dramatic variation but there is some variation if you take special category states uh, i was looking up some numbers it's the range is from 1.8% for a few states to 4.6% and that's a substantial range for the other states the range is not that large but you don't have a clear definition of consuming states getting more tax others getting less tax and so on maharashtra is doing amazingly well um tamil nadu is not uh, you are, you have uh, who are the others west bengal tamil nadu mp ap not doing very well in terms of the ratios uh, maharashtra up bihar doing well so the line of who is doing well who is not doing well is not very clear some states are doing well in terms of tax to gdp ratio but have we got that uh, amazing space of buoyancy where the states feel a little more relaxed i think we haven't yet reached that level of revenues thank you thank you uh, dr rao uh, namita ji i'll turn to you so on the same thing on this uh, gst revenues uh, you are coming from the state finance uh, Uh, department uh, government of rajasthan so what is the view from from the state on on this issue uh, talking about the view from the state i think as uh, dr kavita had just said to assess the situation post gst i think the two impediments are one the covid break that we had it had actually distorted 
statistics for everybody from all perspectives. So still to draw a realistic conclusion is difficult. Secondly, GST is still a evolving uh, regime, if I can say. We have new notifications coming regularly, new in terms of procedure and substance. So it would be too early to comment how it has affected. And one more point that even because of the COVID break also, the state tax machinery will also take a little more time to get acclimatized to this new regime and to utilize it the best possible way. And what ma'am was just saying about uh, consumption-based and origin-based taxation, I think in GST, when we compare one state with the other, now because you know earlier we were, it was the origin-based taxation and now we have consumption-based, so maybe comparing one state with other would be a wrong counterfactual. We should look at what that state would have done earlier in the same economic scenario. So that is why I feel right now we still cannot say how good or how bad it has been for state finances. I think it will take a little more time to come to a more realistic assessment for that. Thank you. Thank you, Navdaji. So that's, that, that is one when, where we were looking at uh, the tax revenues. Now, uh, Mr. Devara, I'll turn to you. And uh, you are coming from one of the uh, largest states in terms of uh, state finances. So we have seen a trend of uh, imposition of cesses and fees as a means of revenue. And uh, clearly, it has been a bone of contention in, 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 in the fiscal federalism debate. And uh, there are a uh, lot of revenues which don't, don't get into the, the divisible pool because uh, it stays outside. And therefore, uh, clearly, they don't get devolved to the state governments. So, uh, and, and of course, this point has been made by the states to uh, successive finance commissions. So what is your view on this, Ms. Is and, and some states are also contemplating possibly walking the same path and uh, to because there is a GST. So uh, if they could impose certain cesses and, and uh, other uh, impositions which are outside the tax uh, uh, per se. So uh, any views from the state, what is emerging on this issue from? Uh, one is the center state, the vertical imbalance that Professor Kumar talked about, and uh, also from the state government perspective from uh, generation of additional revenues for the state governments. Yeah, thank you, Renan. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Shailesh uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's wonderful uh, being here and talking about uh, state finances. Probably this is the first time ever uh, there was a discussion, debate on uh, state of state finances which is quite critical at this uh, present moment. So I really appreciate the initiative of uh, Shailesh to make it part of uh, Tax Congress. Uh, having said that, uh, yes, uh, surcharge and cess. Before getting into that, I would like to say, yes, uh, state uh, finances uh, are not that bad as it is being uh, portrayed. Actually, states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and other uh, states, even Bihar and UP, uh, if you see the fiscal parameters, which are under FRBM, they are, uh, they are really good. States like Maharashtra, UP, Karnataka have extremely strong uh, fiscal parameters prescribed by uh, FRBM. So we are much below the F, uh, fiscal BRM, uh, FRBM, like 2.2% is the debt. The same way tax to GDP is also quite good. Uh, but uh, there are other challenges to state financial management. Probably that also would be discussing in the course of time. Uh, coming to surcharge and sales, uh, GST, when it came, probably we thought, no, it would, be, it would not be there. Uh, but however, we have uh, surcharges and uh, cess happening today, almost like 40, 46 different varieties of surcharges and this thing. So if you see the figures, this is what uh, RBI and uh, CAG says, almost like 19.8% of uh, gross tax receipts, they don't come under divisible pool, So which is a huge amount. Uh, probably uh, the states do have uh, 
a claim and right on these things, on these uh, such as, however the constitution prevents, mandates, only the central government is supposed to use it. As a result, uh, state governments d get deprived of uh, having their share in these results. To that extent, they are deprived. They don't get a share into that. Having said that, uh, even the 14th Finance Commission did say 42% of the revenue receipts should go to the states. That is a central share in the state government uh, revenues. Even if you see it last couple of years, four or five years, the data says out of this 42%, if you see the entire tax kitty of the central government, only 36% comes in. So there also we are, I mean, states are losing out something like uh, five to seven percent of the entire uh, tax kitty, which is quite a uh, concern for the states. Probably states in different platforms when we meet with the financial, uh, financial team of the central government, we do mention, raise these issues, but still probably there is a reform required to see how devolution happens more effectively, more uh, better, uh, in a better fashion. Probably a new regime has to come for uh, devolution of devolution and uh, forming these uh, uh, assess and surcharge uh, usage. But uh, even the CAG says there are uh, some charge, uh, surcharges wherein huge amounts of money get locked up, get parked, unutilized in uh, Consolidated Fund of India. Probably have, had it, they been devolved, uh, had they been given to the state governments, probably it would have been better put to use. And uh, you know the value of money at this point of time. So that's Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Devara. So, uh, Mr. Gag, I'll turn again to you. Uh, so there is a, while, while we, are, we are experiencing good buoyancy in, in tax revenues, etc., but there's a limit to it. Means we, we will have certain growth rates, but it will start normalizing. At some point of time, it will start normalizing. And we are seeing uh, uh, actions, at, at least at the central level, to see how we can generate more non-tax revenues. Now, at the state level, we have seen that the non-tax revenues, primarily what comes from mining, uh, other than that, uh, it is it is it's quite minuscule. So, uh, is it, and you have been advising a state which was stressed, and uh, uh, which is Punjab. So any ideas on what the state should do looking at the non-tax revenue side of it and, and enhancing the non-tax revenues? Yeah, first of all, the context, you know, states spend about 18% of the GDP, that is the total expenditure of a state. Whereas the non-tax revenues for India as a whole I think it will be 1.2 or 1.3%, which includes, as you said, the mineral resources. If you exclude that, practically non-tax revenues are going to be very insignificant number. Now, as I said in the beginning, there is an impossible trinity. How do you spend more while having the lower tax rate? Something has to go up, and if non-tax revenues have to go up, then First of all, the mindset has to change. What I experienced was, if you tell that let's increase this, something, any, any head, and the first reaction is how much will it give? So it may give, let's say, five crores. Well, by itself, that five crores appears insignificant. So at some stage, we drew a list of 100 things. Okay, let's try to do 100 things in a state. But the problem always was to convince them if you do 100 things, there will be some disturbance or the other. And then somebody will say, why don't you jack up the taxes on petroleum? That itself will take care of things. And instead of doing 100 things, you know, why do that or alcohol or something or the other. So if the country as a whole has to embrace uh, higher amounts from non-tax revenues, First of all, the mindset has to change. Now, I don't want to go into all those hundred heads, but basically anything for which public wants to approach the state government to give him something out of the term, for which there can be, let's say, rent-seeking behavior on the part of an official or anybody, something which somebody wants, tatkal kind of a thing. I think you can draw a list of all of those things 
each is a potential source of non-tax revenues. Whether it is allotment of a VIP number, whether it is getting something done quickly, well, I can go on endlessly. You want to go in a hospital, keep it open for one hour extra, or one kind of people who would pay, uh, let's say, half the what Apollo or a private hospital charges you. There are any number of people who want to pay. You want to give a school building to do, to to kind of to a management institute or an engineering private engineering college. People use it in the evening. Now all these things are available. Now, lots of infrastructure of the state which can be given to private sector, which can be aligned with the needs of the private sector. They would be prepared to pay the, the cost of that kind of a thing. One major revenue source which I don't know anybody has tapped so far is the monetization of the data with the states. Now this is huge value. You know the kind of market capitalization of the data companies. State will have a lot of data. Now, uh, when I was advising, there was no data bill. Now that bill has come. I think states can study how they can make use of this data and provide it on a transparent, e-auctionable manner or a, or a manner which is sustained to the private sector, and they can rake in a lot of money. But at least the user charges must be inflation adjusted. I mean, sometimes the fees and charges are so insignificant, they haven't been revised for decades. So all of those things are possible. So if you start doing small, small thing, some total will be a respectable number. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garg. I, I think that's, a, that's an important perspective because whenever we work at, uh, regarding non-tax revenues, that, that uh, refrain is there that it's too small to put in the effort. So I think that's that mindset change of Boon boon se pani gada barta hai. So that, that mindset has to come in, uh, in, in the state finances. So Namdaji, I will turn to you. So uh, taking the same topic, so if we have to augment revenues, uh, we understand Rajasthan is doing a lot of things, Governor Rajasthan is doing a lot of things. So how you're using GST experience and, uh, and data analytics, uh, how you're applying that at the state level, what are the initiatives that are underway uh, towards revenue augmentation? Uh, see, talking about GST experience, one thing the states realize in the new regime is the place where they get more room for autonomy is tax implementation rather than the tax policy. So it is the tax administration side which has to be strengthened for the states to optimize revenues. And I believe in the current AI scenario, automation is the first thing that we can think about augmenting state revenues. And in this direction, uh, Rajasthan has come up with the integrated revenue management system, what we in short call IRMS. The idea behind IRMS is to create an integration of all revenue generating departments or the sectors of the state. As Sir was just saying that states will have to look forward to other sources of revenue, prioritize them, and optimize the collections from them. In keeping that in mind, the state has come up with the concept of IRMS where we are creating automation in all places where we have revenue and like even in GST, we have gone ahead to make the day-to-day -day operations online and fully automated. And uh, we are integrating the portals, like most states, we do have portals for uh, GST, we have a portal for registration and stamps, we have portals for mines, but there is very little interaction between these portals. So the effort right now is to make these portals interactive so that there is data sharing and then there can be better data analysis to augment the state revenues. And uh, in the same con consequence, we have also designed a automated and optimized system for VAT because today, VAT is still important for states in terms of non-subsumed goods. So for VAT also, we have a very advanced and an optimized uh, system which is integrated with GST. This integration helps us to prepare 360 degree profiles so that state can have better revenue administration. This level of professionalism or integration was not there with states earlier. So the idea is to have a more holistic picture 
for the state finances. And uh, second thing, as uh, we were just talking about use of AI. So the state is moving forward to create a facility of e-tax officer or a, a self-tax scrutiny kind of a system in GST where we can improve compliances through this AI-based uh, e-tax officer so that even before there is a vision, a person knows that this was the compliances I had to make and it can be done in a more automated manner. And to facilitate compliances further, we have also come up with the concept of tax mitra. And in that, we are empaneling youngsters to help the small businesses who were affected by GST and its compliances, basically, to make it a sort of, if I can say, a cost-effective and affordable method for small businesses to get expert help for better compliance. So that is one another approach that the state is trying. So like Sir was just said, I'll just uh, continue in that, that non uh, the other sources of revenue have become very important for the states and at least for the state of rajasthan we can say we are very seriously looking at integrating these avenues so that we can have a more holistic picture of state finances and we can work towards better revenues for the state thank you so, namta i'll stay with you uh, so rajasthan has always taken a, a a kind of a unique and innovative path as far as uh, the uh, the digitalization and uh, and in, uh, the adoption of information technology. Uh, it was the only state which went ahead with uh, developing its own uh, IFMI system, integrated financial management system. All other states went for certain uh, packages, uh, adoption. Uh, and we understand it's very robust and very successful. And then you upgraded it to 2.0. And now what we learn is that Rajasthan has embarked on IFMI's 3.0 whereas other states are still on 1.0 or they are thinking of 2.0. So what are, you, what are the unique features that you're planning in 3.0? It will be, be very interested to know. See, IFMS 3.0 is a very, if I can use the word, a futuristic approach to, towards financial management in the state. We are trying to make IFMS absolutely real-time. Full real-time integration is the main agenda for IFMS 3. And secondly, it has two very uh, sort of contradictory sounding aspects. One is to reduce human intervention, at the same time make IFMS more human centric. So the idea is that we have a better user interface with minimum human intervention. And uh, IFMS 3.0 also has a common disbursement engine where both the treasury route and the banking route are integrated. The idea is to provide seamless facilities to the users, both in terms of the employees of the state as well as the private people who use the IFMS portal. And uh, in IFM, as a part of IFMS 3.0, we also have ITMS, Integrated Tax Management System, wherein we are trying to create modes for automatic tax compliances and reduce the number of returns a person has to follow. The idea is a more simplified, integrated compliance mechanism to provide better taxpayer services, if I can use the word. So it is, in one word, a cost-efficient tax compliance. So yes, IFMS 3.0 is a very ambitious project, which we have rolled out in phases. I and mean, a few facilities have already been uh, are live and we are working forward to implement it full on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nuta ji. Uh, so, Mr. Devara, I'll turn to you. Uh, so, when we talk about public finances, uh, there is one aspect we call, while we have been talking tax revenues, uh, there is also tax expenditures, which is essentially the tax incentives that uh, the states compete with each other to provide to businesses to attract uh, the businesses to their states. Now, clearly these can be matched by all the states and, and more or less what we have seen is uh, the incentives are very close to each other and there could be some tweaks here and there a little bit that states provide. So do these incentives really help uh, the states or is it, a, is it a drain? And because the investment decisions may not really be based only on tax incentives. Yeah, it's a, a good question actually. So, uh, uh, Maharashtra probably probably one of the major states 
wherein uh, we provide uh, large scale tax incentives to attract uh, industry service sector into maharashtra uh, probably we are not the only state uh, there are uh, across the st across the country we have every state competing with each other to provide uh, more and more uh, tax incentives uh, as a result of late if you see last 4 uh, to 5 years yeah last 10 years if you see it uh, the foreign investors foreign companies who are coming to india they go on a uh, state shopping they go on uh, state shopping they go to tamil nadu they have a discussion there they come back to maharashtra they go to gujarat they go to up so they keep on doing uh, state shopping and in the process they spend at least 3 uh, 4 years in understanding uh, states ecosystem then they decide suddenly uh, i mean whatever are the factors but probably their uh, economic factors financial factors do matter when they take a decision in locating themselves situating themselves in a particular state but however maharashtra having said that maharashtra happens to be uh, the largest uh, fdi attractor probably last year we were the first first ranker we had almost like uh, 38 billion usd coming into maharashtra last financial year even this financial year if you see the first first and second quarter data uh, maharashtra is once again leading into fdi investments but however here uh, the question is the quality of uh, expenditure we do whether it is revenue expenditure committed expenditure or even uh, capital expenditure so as a policy state government in maharashtra actually probably most of the state governments also should be doing it uh, we should try and see how we can uh, curtail our uh, uh, committed expenditure which is almost in the range of uh, as uh, ashwini said uh, committed expenditure for some of the states is like something like 70 75% punjab it may be more than that that's what uh, garg sir said uh, but maharashtra we have uh, we have almost like 52% of the committed expenditure however uh, where is the rest of the uh, budget is going into one is uh, we have uh, revenue expenditure part of it which is into schematic schemes and other things then we have capital expenditure of late of late last 3 4 years capital expenditure has been really going up that is where the quality of expenditure matters a lot when i say capital expenditure generally recurring expenditure gives you immediate one year returns the impact would be hardly one year or yeah, one and a half year if we have capital expenditure which is like uh, say 15 20% it has long term stronger impact on micro economic impulses so as a result uh, states tend to these days uh, with the with the interstate competitions coming up states tend to build up on their capital formation apart from that government of india very recently has come out in the last budget they have come up with a package of uh, 1 lakh 30000 crore uh, scheme wherein they are giving interest free you know, capital expenditure loans so that is going if you see the last six months to data six states have used it extensively that's what rbi report says the latest report of rbi says six states have used it extensively and their capital expenditure went up by almost 68% so what i mean to say is that the quality of expenditure is quite important so that's where uh, the state governments have to focus it even the government of india is focusing on that uh, along with that uh, as uh, as you said in the earlier question uh, how do we increase our uh, non tax revenues non tax revenues some of them is as uh, uh, garg sir said data monetization apart from that maharashtra is doing extremely well in uh, monetizing its own assets public sector assets even land resources we have even various other resources how do we uh, uh, complement supplement our own uh, tax revenues that way even uh, non tax revenues are uh, growing up in maharashtra but still we have a long way and uh, uh, kilometers to travel thank you thank you mr devara so uh, mr gov i'll turn to you uh, so in in the path to fiscal consolidation we have talked about revenues a lot more but we have not talked about the expenditure side of it or the efficiency on the expenditure side of it so what are the things that the states could do which could give them quick gains on the expenditure efficiency side of it which could also aid in the path of uh, fiscal consolidation 
No, anybody who can answer this question satisfactorily should be given Bharatatna. <laughs> you see, the problem with expenditure management, and there have been lots of committees on that. First of all, different states have different problems. The tenure of a government is five years in the state. And in my view, this problem can only be solved with a time perspective much longer than five years. Now, if you are in a situation like that, then you need to create an institutional structured framework spread over maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years to address this because it can't be done in a year by anybody. You are dealing with sovereign governments. You can here and there, central government can incentivize them, maybe a little bit penalize at times. Penalize is not a correct word. So the first thing that comes to my mind and is that you need a some kind of an OECD or a G20 kind of framework, first of all. You have 28 states. You've got to bring them on the table. Now, the major culprit in my understandings is the administrative costs, the salaries, the pension, then excessive debts, then these subsidies on power and so on and so forth the quality of expenditure and so many things. So there has to be a broad agreement on the key deliverables, key expenditure areas, and how should all the states move together. And then you don't have a competitive populism. And then instead of simply saying that FRB ta FRBM target is so much, you will perhaps have multiple targets. Nobody will exceed a certain number. Again, giving an example of Punjab, we compare ourselves with Haryana, which was once a part of the Punjab. Our wages were 25 percent higher than same position in Haryana. We had, in certain departments, 40 percent higher manpower, and we were paying them 13 months' wages. Okay, because we thought they were doing some department, particularly with large this thing and workforce. We had 1,000 schools in which there were one student each, but four teachers. Now, you tell an MLA that I want to shut your school and I will give him a kind of a voucher to study in a private school. He says, you can't shut the school. So lots of suggestions you know, I would be giving, and then CM will say they're very good. Again, the problem was, I will sign the first you understand that point? So that is the key issue. So I was once giving him a presentation on the scope of digitization, for example. I said, you have one lakh ten thousand teachers. You don't need more than, let's say, 100 or 200, max 1,000 to give e-education. And in my personal view, sorry, the education today is of no use for the kind of jobs that are going to arise or that are already arising in future. So you are A, teaching them with a workforce of let's say one like 10,000, which will train them to become nothing, only frustrated. The education that is required to be given doesn't exist in those schools, cannot be provided by those teachers, whatever levels of training. But if you have, let's say, 1,000 teachers properly trained, etc., they can impart education to the whole country. And somebody has to collaborate. Similarly, e-health, now you have Bharat Net. Every village of the country is connected on a fast-speed net. The range of services. In fact, we were seeing FIRs can be lodged in that manner. There was hardly any service which could not be delivered in that manner at a much cheaper cost. But if the interest of the state is employment itself, and I have to employ 50,000 people. Then what do you do? With or without work? When I had two standards, none of them could type. So what do you do with that kind of a thing? So the expenditure management is a very sensitive subject. It encompasses practically redefining the way governance is being done in the states. 
no single person, howsoever motivated, howsoever brilliant, can do it. It is a collective effort. We got to realize and do it bit by bit. Don't have very ambitious target. Even if we do it over 20 years, we don't allow situation to worsen from where we are. Finally, India is in Amrit Kal period. As a proportion of our GDP, some of these numbers will automatically come down. We don't allow them to worsen. So those are the kind of things. Lastly, again, technology. There are many departments in the state where supervision, quality of expenditure is bad. One can use things like even drones to supervise, let's say, mining, let's say, irrigation department, so many things. And one can have a control room kind of a thing in the CM's office. You can keep a decent watch whether the expenditure is being correctly done. These are some of the things. that The whole country has to kind of wake up to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gar. While our uh, time for the panel is up, but I think this last question I'll pose to both uh, Dr. Kavita Rao and Professor Kumar. Uh, because uh, India is, is, is gaining in economic strength. Uh, incomes are growing, though it is uneven. We need social security. Uh, we need job creation. Uh, so any, any quick uh, uh, ideas on the next gen public financial management tools or reforms or actions that, uh, since you are working on at, at the policy level and you are at the academy level, uh, any, any quick responses on what could be the next gen things that the state should be looking at and even central uh, centers should be looking at? Um, I won't call them tools, but I think uh, the crux of the matter is to get states to be talking together again. Um, I, just taking quickly from what Mr. Devra said about uh, competition among states. Uh, Pre-VAT, there was a lot of competition among states. Maharashtra and Gujarat used to compete madly to provide incentives. Um, from there, we came to a position where states agreed not to give incentives. And then we creep back again. And the introduction of VAT again was one such a joint effort. So there is merit in trying to um, uh, to get states to talk together, to find space to collaborate, and therefore not having to run each other down. Uh, the old pension scheme conversation, for example, is a big um, elephant in the room. Everybody wants old pension. Um, every state believes it has to deliver it to win elections. So once the, we've let uh, the elephant lose, it's very difficult to bring it in. Can we have conversations to to ensure that we all start competing on something else. Uh, is that a tool? Perhaps not. But uh, with 28 states pulling in different directions, I think we need more com conversation. That's the only way forward. Uh, uh, let me just come back, you know, uh, perhaps it, seem, it seems like I'm going to sum up. So let me speak like academic, uh, you know, practitioner academic uh, who looks at the states very closely. I've spent my last 20 years in the States. Uh, you know, you remember my work with NRGA. And I, I remember, you know, in my task force, uh, I very strongly emphasized about uh, two things. One, the challenges for the States, uh, the state finances. And the, where are the challenges? So very briefly, two or three points I would raise. And I'm sure most of the officials, top officials are familiar. One is uh, like a ticking time bomb. And you can see that some states have already reverted to old pension scheme. This is, this is I'm going to tell you, is going to affect you politically and also in terms of the macroeconomic stability. I'm not speaking more like, you know, a typical neoliberal economist because uh, I have a very progressive idea about, uh, you know, pension reforms. But that pension reforms have to be done which is a challenge and also part of what I call next generation reforms for state finances. Two also, I guess uh, many of us are familiar with our problems in, with regard to you know, taxes on a property. And uh, here, I mean, uh, this is an age old problem for state finances. And especially those states which have huge issue of urbanization, uh, you, they are struggling with that. And this is where uh, the power distributes, and I think we haven't touched on that from the state finances perspective, which is a continuing legacy and a challenge for state finances. Uh, 
So these are three, four issues which are challenges and also uh, these are impulses for next generation reforms. And I'm sure the top administrators in the states and policy makers are considering. And finally, let me come back and conclude here in a reimagining state finances primarily from the climate perspective and climate change. In the global, I guess, uh, when we went to Durban, and in the Durban conference, we raised this issue in a, from a micro perspective rather than a macro perspective. Back home, we haven't uh, dealt with it, uh, perhaps in the policy context, uh, both in the central government or in the state government, how climate change is going to affect state finances. And especially in the regions you have seen, Kerala, Kerala, Odisha, Maharashtra, coastal regions are already stressed, already stressed. And two, agriculture is a state subject which is going to suffer hugely by climate change. So we need to really look at, we have done a report for rural development ministry, uh, you know, it's called greening the agriculture, greening the rural development, which is a huge issue for the state finances. I don't know who is going to fund that. I, I'm, I was approached by United Nations Climate uh, you know, Office uh, asking me to reflect on that further, how you are going to fund that greening of the agriculture. Otherwise, let me tell you, India will become desert. And if India becomes desert, a state would suffer. And Maharashtra is already reeling under that and Odisha. So, and finally, the challenge of urbanization, the challenge, challenge of, you know, increasing city life. Who is going to fund that? How the, in the cities, in the new climate regime, emergent climate scenario will take care of itself? And this is something where I don't see any discussion, any conversation, and I'm very happy Shalender has brought us together, you know, initiating, uh, initiating this kind of a conversation, which is important to sensitize policymakers, top policymakers, and also last mile policymakers, including the panchayat officers. When I visit a panchayat, I see a panchayat, sarpanch, and a mukhiya, and a pradhan more concerned about the impact of the climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kumar. And I think uh, collaboration, cooperation, restraint, and I think uh, since the climate-related uh, vagaries that public finance are exposed to, possibly insurance as a tool also for, uh, to, look, to be looked at uh, by, by the state finance departments uh, to, to uh, guard against the damages that public finances suffer from uh, uh, climate vagaries. So thank you, panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, and it has been a great discussion. I'm sure that we're taking back a lot of learnings. Thank you. Can you have the mic up? Thank you to all the panelists and thank you so much, Mr. Banerjee, for moderating the session. I request all of you to please get together for the group photograph. And I also request Mr. Kailash Golesha, founder of Amrit Digital Era Mumbai and advisor TIOL, to please come on stage to present a small token of appreciation to all the panelists. While we present the token of appreciation, ladies and gentlemen, another gentle reminder. Just behind you is the Alamgir Hall where we have the setup for your video bites. Please make sure you take two minutes of your time and go to Alamgir Hall and share your experience, your feedback for the TIOL Tax Congress 2023 there.
Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Golesha, for doing the honors.